I've got one o'clock on my clock here, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started and welcome everybody, and then I'm going to turn it over and, and excited to hear this presentation. So welcome everyone. Uh, before this session starts, I have a statement to read on behalf of the conference. The Open Education Southern Symposium strives to offer an open, inclusive, and friendly environment for all participants. All attendees are expected to help maintain a professional and welcoming environment free of any type of harassment by being mindful of the space and the time you're taking up, by being aware of the dynamics of power and privilege, by being considerate of others' desire for privacy, by being respectful of others, and accepting that the differences in opinion and circumstances create a stronger collaborative environment, and actively challenging individual biases and assumptions. But having said that, I'm going to hush up, and I'm excited to hear the session begin. Thank you, Will. So I hope everybody can see my screen now. And my name is Rodney Powell. I am the executive director of our Center for Academic Excellence at Central Carolina Community College. Um, we rebranded our Center for Teaching and Learning and call, now call it a Center for Academic Excellence because we do more than just teaching and learning. Um, we, there's other stuff involved as well. But um, so that's, that's who I am. And I wanted to spend a few minutes with you today talk, telling you a little bit about our journey in the OER world and what we do and, and how it's gone for us. Um, Central Carolina Community College is kind of a small, medium-sized community college. We serve three counties in Central North Carolina. Um, our total enrollment is somewhere a little bit over 5,000 unduplicated headcount, um, of which 40% are dual enrolled students. So high school students are also taking college or college classes with us. A lot of those college classes, or most of them, are online brand, but um, not all of them. So in they normally come to our campus. We don't normally send instructors to their campus. Um, what got us started in this world of OER? Um, our colleges, our counties, because of the dual enrollment, when they started dual enrollment, they agreed to pay for textbooks for their students, for their high school students who are taking college classes, because that's not a normal cost. It would be associated with public school students. Um, they calculated that in fall of 18, spring 19, summer 19, that if you added up all three counties, that they would have spent a total of $345,000 for textbooks, or they did spend that for their college class students. And so they started to really balk at this. We knew this was coming beforehand um, because we knew what the numbers were already. And so we already had started the conversation about how can we help cut some of the costs for our counties. These are three rural counties that are in general somewhat um, financially challenged because they're rural, right? They just don't have the tax base that urban areas do. So in the fall of 2018, we started a discussion with the Dean of Arts and Sciences about looking at some of the large enrolled high school classes, particularly introductory psychology and sociology. He agreed to fund a year-long development process, so a full OER development, not just taking uh, OpenStax books, but to have these people actually develop their own course materials, their own OER materials um, to use in these courses. And then that material will be used by all the instructors that are teaching these sections. So that was the beginning in 2018. So that's kind of, so three years ago, not that long ago, really. Um, about that same time, um, I was driving down the road one morning and heard an article on NPR about open education and went and looked at And a few days later, I got an article from CC Daily talking about um, McHenry Community College and what they were doing um, in the OAR world and using business um, for their business programs. Um, so I posted on Facebook to our um, VP of academics and to a dean. And I said, hey, we should hold some boot camps like this. And they said, well, that's great. Why don't you do that? Uh, so always be careful what you suggest because you'll be put in charge of it. And that's how I got started. Um, our VP at the time was Dr. Brian Merritt. He's now moved on. He's now president of a, of a community college. But he spent a few minutes looking up the cost of textbooks on our campus that our students were paying. And he put together a really good memo encouraging faculty to participate in OER. Um, about the same time, the state of North Carolina and NC, an organization called NC Live had some course development grants that they were giving out. And we um, encouraged our faculty to apply for those as well. Um, and so he, he was very supportive of us doing this. 
our marketing people developed an OER flyer, excuse me, that we um, sent out to all of our faculty, as well as to a lot, um, not just our full-time faculty, but also our adjuncts, encouraging them to think about what are the best course materials for their course. Um, is it a full cost textbook? Is it OER? Is it some combination? Is there a low cost um, media, um, intermediary there that you could somehow access? Um, and so just to know what is the best thing that you could use for your course. Um, and thanks, Will, for putting the link to NC Live in there. Um, so, um, so we are very encouraging of our faculty to do these things. Um, the next step we said is, okay, let's have a boot camp because a lot of our faculty don't know about OER, don't even know what it stands for. So we had a one day session in January of 2019, which is um, in a week, our faculty come back to campus about a week before classes start. Um, and so we had one day that was devoted all to learning about OER. Um, we brought in Una Daly, who um, is the executive director of CCC OER. Um, she was very helpful with that. Um, we joined CCC OER so that we could have access to all the resources and webinars and things that they do. It's an amazing organization. If you're a community college, I definitely recommend you join. Um, dues are about, I think they're $750 a year, but they're, it's a great way to get started and learn about OER. So Una presented a keynote speech. We, we brought in some student testimonials to tell what would you do if you had $1,000 a semester that you didn't have to spend on textbooks. What would you do with that money? Um, and of course, they're like, well, I work two jobs and I don't, also, I don't always have gas money. Um, I'm sometimes food insecure. And so lots of things were you know, done like that. Um, we had about a third of our full-time faculty attend um, and it generated an amazing interest in OER. Not everybody was convinced. In our post survey, um, one faculty member actually said, well, I need students to pay for textbooks or else I don't know they have buy-in in the course. Um, since the survey was anonymous, I can't fire that person, but I sure wish I could, right? Um, we also brought in some outside faculty from some other community colleges that were already using OER in their courses to share their experiences with what they were doing. Um, so the first two courses we fully developed were Psych 150 and SOS 210. They began the development in fall of 2018. They launched in the fall of 2019 department-wide. In the spring of 2019, um, in order to generate more courses using OER, we took some of the funds that we generate through our distance ed fees, and we solicited proposals from our faculty um, to develop courses via OER. We chose six courses, English 111 and 112, so first and second semester English, Criminal Justice 111, which is a relatively high enrollment course. Um, we thought we would dabble in the labs, and so we, um, Bio 168, 169, are our anatomy and physiology lab manuals. And then our one of our instructional designers um, has developed our Physics 151, 152. So that was the first full summer of course development via OER. And most of those people were paid a stipend of roughly $2,000 to develop those courses. Um, how does our course development process go? We view it as a circular pattern. Um, you can start anywhere on this, but really starting at the top makes sense to us. We you incorporate a backward design model where we start by looking at the course outcomes. What do we want the students to be able to do? Um, we choose the sources to help get them there. We make sure it's ADA compliant. Um, we make sure that all the right attributions are there. Um, ADA, ADA compliance, to be honest, is one of the things that scares a lot of our faculty. Um, alt text and things like that isn't always there. Even in all OER stuff, it's not there. And so we are insisting that all of our stuff be ADA compliant. So that is can be a challenge for some. Then at the end of the cycle, there's a course review process. And the course review process can put you back into the loop redesigning and adding and changing. And of course, all these things interrelate to each other as well. Um, what is backward design? We start with the results. We think about what evidence do you need to demonstrate those results? 
and then how do we get you to be able to demonstrate those results? So we have, it's very intentional and very planned in how we design our courses here. Um, we take advantage of a lot of universal design concepts so that they're ADA compliant, but that every student can access them. We also use lots of quality matters concepts in our courses, particularly our online courses. So then of course, the question becomes, well, what OER sources do I use? I mean, I think, at that point, a lot of our faculty were starting to become more aware of sites like OpenStax, um, which was probably the leader and still is in a lot of areas. And but there are lots of other sources out there. And so one of the big things, challenges that we've had is convincing them that we have the resources on our campus and we have the librarians that can help you find the resources that you need. Um, and so our librarians not only help find those resources, they help find the right resources that are accessible. Um, because accessibility um, isn't just for people with disabilities, it makes it even more accessible to everybody. From talking to students, and this is very common now from talking to other faculty and others and to lots of students, lots of people, when they watch videos on YouTube, they have the captions on because they want to be able to see that or they would prefer just reading a quick blurb about a picture it's kind of like a a title or a, a um a, a alt text online they don't want to necessarily go and read a whole paragraph but they'll read a sentence or two about something and so we found that using these accessibility guidelines has really helped improve our courses how much did we save our students um in the first year alone we saved them almost $600,000. So that's not only the high school students, but all of our traditional students as well. Because if you're the high school students multiplied by roughly two, um, we save almost $600,000 to our students in the first year alone. We've now been going three years. We've added more courses. We estimate uh, cost savings over $2 million in three years to our students. Um, one of the other things that we decided to do to try to increase awareness on our campus and across the state was we hosted a statewide OER conference. Um, it was mostly geared towards community colleges, but it was a one day event um, where people came in and shared their experience with OER. Um, we had everything from librarians to administrators, faculty members. Um, we even had a couple of student testimonials come in for the day and we hosted a one day kind of drive-in conference. We brought in Dr. Sebastian from Achieving the Dream, who was a great advocate um, for OER, and um, we paid for his travel and everything. We had approximately 170 people show up, and what we learned is that lots of people are developing OER on their campus, but they're siloed, and they're not talking to other campuses. So one of our long-term goals is to help facilitate that conversation. Um, our next step on our campus was to say, okay, we're saving our students a lot of money, but is it really in an organized and well-developed manner? So I went to our institutional effectiveness, our research people, our data people, and I said, hey, what are the most popular courses on campus for our university transfer students? Because that's what I teach, I teach chemistry. So I'm like, what are they taking? And so this, they gave me a list of literally every course that students had taken in the last five years. And I said, okay, let's start ticking these courses off from the top to get the most important courses. If you look at this list, you can see Psych 150 and SOS 210 are very close to the top, but they're not necessarily required. Every student doesn't really have to take them. Um, but PD 110 and English 111, if you're going to graduate with an associate in science or associate in arts from us, you got to take those. You also have to take ACA, which is our academic course introduction to college course um, and you see these three courses almost every AA and AS student takes and so we targeted PD 110 ACA 122 and now we're targeting as we work our way down you'll notice that we have some courses down here because those faculty are interested in the person that developed our intro site course wanted to develop site 241 which is developmental site course um, we have some interest in the sciences. Um, Chemistry is being developed. The ones in green have already been developed. The ones in yellow are in the process of being developed and we're working our way down this list. So we are slowly ticking off courses 
towards getting all of the most popular courses developed OER. Um, I think within the next 12 months, we will probably be, I think we'll have everything down through Chem 151 developed within the next 12 months. So we will have the top 20 to 25 courses developed. Actually, I think we'll have English 231 developed as well because it's a required literature course for AA students. So um, I said, well, how does this fit into our students graduating? Can they come here and get a degree without buying a textbook? Could we save them money? And here's the logic I use for thinking about this. It requires 60 credit hours to graduate from us with an associate's degree. 60 credit hours divided by three means 20 courses, 20 courses um, at $100 a course for textbooks was kind of a low number, I think, you know, would be about $2,000, right? So I said, could we save our students $2,000 in the course of two years? Um, here's our associate in arts degree plan. Courses in green have been developed. Courses in yellow are in development. Courses in red mean we don't have them developed and we are trying to twist some arms to get some people to develop them. And so you can see for our associates in arts um, degree, hopefully by the end of the summer, you would be able to finish. We will have the courses developed with the exception of we still need some humanities, fine arts, and a literature course to be developed. But other than that, we're getting really close to an associate's in arts degree. Associate in science, we're missing a humanities, fine arts, and we're missing a second um, math course. So we already have our um, pre-calculus algebra course developed. It was just finished recently. Now we have to get our pre-calculus trig course developed, and that we have somebody that's going to be working on that soon. And so we'll be one course sh shy of a student being able to enter next fall and then finish a degree without having, without having purchased a textbook at all. Um, um, okay, yeah. So um, we now have moved beyond just asking the question of how much money are we saving in whole because yeah okay two million dollars is an impressive sounding number but now starting next fall we believe we're going to be able to track how many students could come in here and finish a degree and not actually purchase a textbook um, what implications does this have for us um, we need to be able to track our retention and completion rates um, we do that already um, but like a lot of colleges, we have lots of um, initiatives that are going on on campus to help improve retention and completion. Um, we're not sure exactly how to tease this out of the data yet, but we're working on it. Um, some, of, some current literature suggests that it can increase the number of hours per semester that a student can take. So if you take $2,000, spread that over, five, over four semesters, that's $500 a semester, that's roughly two or two and a half courses at our community college. So they could go from maybe from being a part-time student to being a full-time student, which would mean they would be able to complete in a more reasonable amount of time as opposed to taking all that extra time and staying part-time because we know the longer they stay enrolled with us, the higher the likelihood becomes of them dropping out at some point. So there is an advantage to shortening the time to completion, taking an extra course or two and finishing earlier. And so our future lies in not just understanding how much money we've saved our students in mass because it, it now becomes, are we really making a difference to each individual student and helping them graduate in a, in a timely manner? Um, one of the comments that Julie has is, yeah, um, the grants are, some of the grants expired. Yes, they did. The NC Live grants expired. Um, we've been fortunate on our campus. We still have funding. Um, our VP and our new VP that is in charge of academics um, are very supportive of taking some of our educational funds and we fund our faculty to develop courses during the summertime. So most of our faculty are nine-month faculty. It's we fund them at basically the same rate as teaching a course in the summer 
time. So if we can fund you for a couple of thousand dollars to teach a course, um, we can fund you to develop a course that then will have a lasting impact um, on our college. And so currently this summer, we're developing about seven courses, I think, several in the sciences. Um, they're spread all over campus. Um, and so we have lots of interest across campus. Um, we're starting to gain interest from some of our CTE faculty, particularly in health sciences. Um, they're taking a look at the open nursing materials that are coming out. So we're optimistic, you know, because some of our CTE programs like nursing and dental hygiene are very expensive because of all the ancillary supplies they have to buy, scrubs, stethoscopes, and all that kinds of thing. So we're looking at those programs now as well to bring them into the fold with our university transfer programs and to try to increase our completion in those because of funding for them. So we've been very fortunate in our group to, um, to, to have our um, upper administration support spending our academic funds on course design and completion or uh, design and as opposed to just paying for faculty salaries that we can target them. So I know I'm gonna finish a few minutes early, but I appreciate everybody that's here today. Um, and I am more than willing to hang out for a little while and answer questions or do whatever else. My contact information is on here. Um, email is absolutely the best way to get me. Um, it's on my phone it, to my, my wife hates it that it's on my phone. Um, I just took a two week vacation. I didn't answer a single email but that's probably the only time in my life I've ever done that. So um, email me, please, if you want to talk to me. And if you want to talk, we can call or we can Google chat or something. But email is a great way to get started with me. So thank you for coming today. And I'll take any questions you guys have. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation. We do have about five minutes. So if you want to ask any questions in the chat or unmute and ask them that way, we're happy to answer now. Or, or as Rodney said, happy to do it by email asynchronously as well. Does our campus have a way to share, or do you encourage faculty to share their completed OER cards? Yeah, that's one of the things we just got. A, I don't know who asked this. I can't see who asked it. Um, that's a great question. Um, we just hired a new VP. Um, and she is our chief academic officer. And I had a two hour meeting with her right before I went on vacation. And it was one of the things that I brought up with her because in our policies and procedures, it actually says that you're not allowed to share outside of our college. And so I said to her, I said, look, I said, if we want to really be serious about OER, so when we pay to fully develop a course, we actually should also pay to have the course licensed, right? CC licensed. And she goes, you're absolutely right. And so I, I got a feeling that this fall, I'm gonna be working on updating our policies and procedures to include that because that's really where it should be. Um, I mean, I think Open Oregon is a great example of the sharing of courses like that. Um, and that's where I want us to be. But yeah, our policies and procedures was written for this aspect probably 10 or 15 years ago before all this really became much more accessible. And so we're gonna, we are definitely gonna update it. Yeah, Tiffany, I agree, gasp, yes. It's, 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 it's not good, but we're gonna, we're gonna work on it. Yeah, it is hard to get faculty on board with the notion of sharing because they view it as their academic license. But you know, let's be honest. I'm still faculty, I still teach. Um, I don't do anything brand new or very rarely do I do something brand new. I steal stuff from everybody, right? That's what instructors do is, I mean, we don't come, I mean, occasionally we come up with a great, really clever new idea, but most of the time it's borrowing from other work that's been done. So, um, I mean, I understand it takes time to put presentations together and all that kind of stuff or even videos or whatever, but, um, you know, this is education. And I got a feeling that 30 years from now, we're going to be looking back at this discussion and going, why weren't we already sharing all that? Like, what was the thought process behind that? Because um, it's, it's, it's going the other direction for sure. So 
Um, are we using COVID funds for faculty stipends? Absolutely, we are. Um, that's what's going to pay for all the ones that I'm doing that we're doing right now. Yeah, because all those courses are also taught online. Um, it, it, we don't have a. We do have some courses that are not taught online at our college, but the bulk of almost every university transfer course that I can think of is taught both modes, right? And last year they were all taught online. So um, yeah, we're using some COVID funds to um, help pay some stipends. I mean, in the grand scheme of COVID funds, it's pretty small. I mean, $2,000 per course times seven courses, $14,000. That's not a lot, right? Yeah, I agree with that statement. Um, that research papers that are openly licensed are referenced far more than copyrighted ones. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in the research world. I spent a dozen years as a researcher before I came to a community college, and uh, it was always a pain to get papers and things from other people. So, um, like, we got time for one more question here, um, and then we can hang out and chat. But folks, we need to dash off. So maybe okay. Cindy's was it hard to get the request approved? Hard to get which request approved, Cindy. You mean to fund? Um, I guess she's asking about to fund courses. Um, COVID funds, no, no, it wasn't. Um, I know the person is in charge of the COVID funds or is handling all that. She's a, um, and she understands. She also teaches, she, she runs a lot of our um, grants programs, but she also teaches adjunct force in business. And so she sees that need. She saw that need there, so it was pretty easy to get that done. Um, let's see. There's Great. somebody else. If you need to stop, can we stay and just chat for a few minutes with um, other people? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and stop the recording now, um, and I think we can maybe hang out for another minute or so. Here comes a stop the recording.